My name is Chris Hatley. I'm the CEO of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia. I'm delighted to welcome you all here, both our panellists and our attendees. Before we begin, I'm going to just um, start by sharing an acknowledgement of country video that we've made for this purpose. Wherever you are across Australia, we acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians, custodians of, of this land. land. The Darug peoples. The Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. The, the Gundungurra, Gundungurra people of the, of the Southern, Southern Highlands. The Ngunnawal people of the Canberra region on whose country we are standing. And all other peoples of this vast continent. Their ongoing connection through custodianship of its land and waters. Physical and spiritual through culture, language and ceremony. Where sovereignty was never ceded, we pay our respects to Elders past, present and still to come. Thank you very much. So um, I'm joining from Ngunnawal country here in Canberra. Uh, day five of lockdown, uh, we're starting to appreciate deeply um, all of our colleagues in Victoria and Sydney and what you've been going through this past little while. So to kick off our uh, webinar series, this is the first of the series, I'm now going to introduce uh, Professor Roy McLeod. Roy is a Fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences and a Fellow of the Academy of the Humanities. And he is going to introduce our series and introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Chris, and thank you all very much for coming and being part of this exercise, which I hope will um, be, mark a start <laughs> of a longer conversation that the two academies to which I belong will continue in concert with their fellow academies or sister academies, I should say, uh, and will, uh, uh, I hope, inspire um, a conversation more widely throughout the country. I wanted to say to all our participants and attendees, welcome and good morning, Sydney time, uh, to this inaugural series on Australia's future in space and emerging agenda for the social sciences. My name is Chris, as Leah said, is Roy McLeod. I'm a historian of science and an emeritus professor of history at Sydney University. As one born in the Kennedy generation who has lived with space most of his life, I would like to share with you my interest and passion in this adventure some may say, and I would say with deep respect, that to launch a, a series uh, like this in the midst of the worst pandemic in a century is for many reasons perhaps not the best idea. But uh, we are doing so nonetheless. And certainly in no way must we lest our attention be distracted from the urgencies of the day. But for a moment, I'd like you to just sit with me and with us and let us slip the surly bonds of earth and with lifting minds, consider what might be awaiting us and may well be upon us even before the end of the present decade. For many, the idea that we as humans will be active in space is already a given. During the last two years, just during the last two years, few will have missed the last rapid series of space-related events happening around the world. In 2019, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the lunar landing. In 2020, China's Chang 5 returned the first lunar samples that Earth has seen in 40 years. The International Space Station celebrated its 20th anniversary and welcomed the crew of DEMO 2, the first in NASA's commercial crew program. The same year, the European Space Agency launched a solar orbiter, the most complex scientific laboratory to have been sent to the sun so far. This year, this year, uh, we, there have been no fewer than 11 significant space missions already. February brought us extraordinary views of Mars when the UAE's ship Hope successfully orbited the red planet and NASA's uh, Perseverance and China's Tianwen uh, One touched down safely. In March, we saw the success of SpaceX and in June, news of NASA's commercial payload services. In the meantime, NASA's Juno mission taught us more about our solar system's largest planet. And soon in October, uh, we are going to see, I think, the launch of the James Webb 
Space Telescope, one of the most ambitious scientific um, missions uh, yet uh, conceived. And in November, NASA is planning to send uh, Orion, an, an, an Artemis mission that will, I suppose, test us whether it's possible to get humans back and forth to the moon easily and safely. All these are, of course, the work of science and technology on a grand scale, and we'll, we're used to them by now. But we've also seen the arrival of things we're not quite used to, in the forms of human endeavor, and now, most recently, in the shape of space tourism, led by Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson, and sure, soon, I'm sure, to be followed by Elon Musk. Space has become a very human enterprise already, replete with human stories of competition and controversy and rivalry. Many see in this a danger of principles and possibilities being rushed by commercialization, raising questions about the ethics and behavior that should frame our presence in space. Meanwhile, of course, the hard work of space diplomacy proceeds apace. Nations have long debated the need to strengthen the provisions and promise of the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, and so far, 12 countries have become signatories to the Artemis Accord to create, in NASA's words, a safe and transparent environment that facilitates exploration, science, and commercial activities for all of humanity to enjoy it. But as a result, we've begun to think more closely about the social and human aspects of space exploration, commercial travel, possibilities of settlement, and the environment. Indeed, how are we to conduct ourselves and behave towards the new environments that we are destined to encounter? How will our interaction be space be driven by a few, but benefit, we hope, the many? Such questions force us to reflect upon the role that the social sciences ought to play, hand in hand with the natural sciences and technologies that have so far dominated the scene. In this act of reflection, I believe it's also time to fashion a focus on Australia and on Australia's presence and potential particip participation in the space enterprise. Well, as several historians, including Kerry Doherty, notably, have uh, reminded us, actually, Australia has a long history of engagement with space. Indeed, since now, since 2018, we have our own space agency, a so far fairly modest government investment that we hope will open new frontiers. But meanwhile, we have excellent media coverage and several centers devoted to space law, strategy, and defense. But it seems to me that apart from all this, social scientists and humanists have a particular responsibility to ask more fundamental questions, not only about the how, but also about the whether and the why, and in what ways, to what ends, and with what consequences. We must question in whose interests do we as Australians venture first to the moon and then to Mars and beyond. Well, it's to these questions that this series of uh, nine sessions is devoted. We have nine moderators and their teams who have kindly accepted our invitation to direct and draw upon their respective discourses of culture, history, health, heritage, law, diplomacy, industry, some of whom, I hope, will deal with the practicalities of living in space. To conclude the series, uh, we've asked two generations of younger Australians, recent graduates and some still in school, uh, to join us and to reflect upon the prospect of their own spacefaring futures. We hope you'll enjoy this effort and uh, under the circumstances and participate in our conversations through the chat mechanism as Chris Hatherley has um, indicated. And all these sessions will be recorded and made available, of course, later uh, for future viewing. At the moment, I would like to give warm acknowledgements to all members of our teams and to the many who have helped us in these particularly awkward times. At the moment, let me start by thanking uh, Chris Hatherley himself and the Academy of the Social Sciences and my colleagues of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Sydney University. Our guides, Jose Tutorialba and Jacob Craig, and most especially my dear colleague, Ms. Claire McFarlane for getting us safely underway. As we start, I have the pleasure of, of launching the, the exercise by introducing, or by welcoming, you've already been introduced, I think, to Professor Juan Francisco Salazar of Western Sydney University to um, open his conversation with his colleagues on sense-making about science. Juan, over to you. 
Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Roy and Chris, for the invitation to speak at this event. And also thank you to Claire McFarland at Sydney University for all her amazing work behind the scenes. And I'd like to also extend my sincere gratitude to my colleagues who have accepted uh, my invitation to share with us today on, on this panel on sense making about space. I will introduce them properly in a minute. Uh, um, I'll just would like to, well, and also thank you, the 28 listeners that we have today, early morning. Uh, I'm welcoming you from Tempe, unceded, unceded country at the mouth of the Cooks River near Botany Bay. Uh, so I would like to join in also acknowledging the custodians, the traditional owners and knowledge holders of this country where I live and work, and all of us except for Alice Gorman, who is in Adelaide the Gadigal, Gamigal, and Wangal people of the Eora Nation who have cared for this land, these waters, and the skies for tens of thousands of years. The space age began arguably 65 years ago when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik. You heard just then from Roy an overview of some of the key developments in recent decades. But understandings of our planet, the solar system, and the universe have changed quite considerably since the first launches of satellites animals and humans into space. On the one hand, the geopolitical context of the Cold War that framed the early space age has shifted as outer space has become a site of uh, intense scientific, economic, cultural and political activity and of national interest to more and more countries. On the other hand, however, Cold War narratives still linger on while new utopian, techno-utopian imaginaries coalesce around interests not only in space exploration, but also in exploitation. Outer space is increasingly becoming a new arena where stratified and spatialized terrestrial socioeconomic and political relations are expanding. Later sessions in this webinar series, as you will see, will discuss in more detail, for instance, how, how the thorny question of governance regimes beyond Earth continue to unfold as new actors, industries, modes of knowledge and technologies are changing the way the low Earth orbit, the Moon and Mars are studied, imagined, accessed, and used for a variety of purposes. Prevailing narratives of space as frontier have started to be challenged by a range of voices and actors from social scientists to space activists to artists who are calling for a shift away from what I would call the recalcitrant narratives of frontiers to embrace a notion of space as environment. This redefinition of space as environment could help open up crucial questions of inclusion, equity, and sustainability in space exploration, which we think are very important. And these are some of the topics that our panel will discuss today. The role of the social sciences and the humanities more broadly is key to illustrate how and why space does not exist in a vacuum, separate from political, social, economic, and cultural values. Take the low earth orbit, for instance, as Lisa Parks, um, an American academic, has written about, signals, transactions, images, and events either take shape with or pass through orbital space. Hence, it is ever more urgent to have a better understanding of how this space is organized, who controls it, and how it has been contested. So if the first space age, say from the late 50s to the early 70s, maybe I can be corrected on that by the historians, took place within a context of the Cold War, civil rights struggles in the US and in Australia, and third world developmentalism, what do we think are the contexts we should be paying attention to, to frame how we make sense about space today? There are so many, and you will see that in the webinar series in the next few weeks and today. But in this panel, we bring attention to at least three. First, as Roy was saying, COVID-19, COVID is here to stay for the next few years, and it's highly likely it won't be the last pandemic as many epidemiologists and public health officials have been alerting us for a while uh, due to the way that biodiversity uh, hotspots are being decreased. Second, the climate emergency, a 2017 report by the World Meteorological Organization in, uh, stated that we have surpassed our understanding of our changing climate and have stepped into uncharted territory. So we're not only stepping into uncharted territory in space, it also has to do with the climate emergency on this planet. This again has been ratified by the sixth IPCC assessment re 
report of the working group one made public last week, and the IPBES, who has declared an irreversible phase of mass biodiversity extinctions in the next decade. This is not only overwhelmingly confronting, as, as we know, but fits right into the narratives of we need a planet B, or we are destined to become a multiplanetary species. And third, the rise of ongoing and new social movements from Me Too, Black Lives Matter, femin feminist movements, counter austerity movements, climate justice, and the Fridays for Future, alt right conspiracy movements. It is very clear that race, class, gender, and other inequalities are ongoing matters of concern from which the space sector is not immune from, especially when discussing issues of diversity in the space industry and the space communities and the relevance of the space sector to society at large. It's interesting to see, for instance, how the rights of nature, for instance, the declaration of the rights of rivers and legal developments around these have had an impact in the space sector in Australia, for instance, with an interdisciplinary group of scholar activists and practitioners writing or developing a declaration of the rights of the moon and Alice Gorman and Kerry Wendovi are part of that team. The concept of decolonization has also taken certain center stage and has been debated in the field of social studies of outer space for a while, precisely to unpack and unmake the legacies of colonialism in space exploration. This is critical for recognizing that sky knowledge has existed for millennia across a range of indigenous astronom astronomical systems of knowledge worldwide. And this knowledge is both culturally and mathematically sophisticated and is still highly relevant for a diverse number of people around the world with strong connections to land, waters, and sky, and for science. Our session today is designed as an opportunity to think creatively and conceptually about outer space, hoping to contribute to unsettling ingrained, ingrained perceptions of space as inert, as a terra nullius to be colonized, or as resources merely to be exploited. We have planned something different as the social sciences become ever more multimodal, we shall start by screening a amazing short film written and produced by one of our panelists, Kerit Wendovi, uh, who is doing, uh, the film is doing a round of important film festivals around the world. So this is a, a very important uh, venue for us and a privilege for us to be watching that film. And then we will engage in a moderated conversation where the panelists will share a few ideas and provocations. You have their bias in the pro program, but let me quickly introduce my colleagues in the panel today. First up is Dr. Alice Gorman, uh, the world famous Alice Gorman, an internationally recognized scholar in the field of space archeology span and author of the award-winning book, Dr. Space Junk versus the Universe, Archeology span and the Future, published by MIT Press a couple of years ago. And she's currently an associate professor at Flinders University in Adelaide and a vice chair of the Global Expert Panel on Sustainable Lunar Activities. Then we will have Rami Mando, he's the founding director and editor of the Australian space community website, spaceaustralia.com, one of the most important platforms in this country that is expanding the accessibility to space for young people across Australia through news, events, education, and citizen science projects. Currently, Rami is in his final year of the Masters of Astronomy and Astrophysics from Swinburne University of Technology and is one of Sydney Observatory's resident astronomers. Then up is Dr. Jeremy Walker, who is a senior lecturer and co-director of the Climate Justice Research Centre at the University of Technology, Sydney, a long-term collaborator of mine with Jeremy. We have published together a few times. And his research has focused on the history of neoliberal economic theory and government, and currently on the relation of this to energy and climate change. And last and first is Gerrit Wendovi, as uh, a fiction writer and essayist based in Sydney. Many of, uh, of you would know her work. Uh, she has published in the New Yorker, the Smithsonian Magazine, Wired, The Monthly, and Alexander and about 10 uh, works of fiction and nonfiction, which uh, I won't go into uh, describe now. In 2020, she won a prestigious Australian Museum Eureka Award for her long form essay on the commercial push to mine the moon. And Kerit Wynn is currently a candidate, a PhD candidate at Western Sydney. And she's the writer and producer of the film Moonrise, 
Uh, and Kurt, when would you kindly please introduce your beautiful film? Thank you, Juan, and thank you to everyone who's made time to listen in this morning. As mentioned, I'm currently doing my Doctorate of Creative Arts at Western Sydney University with Juan as my primary supervisor. And like Juan, I'm really interested in how we imagine our possible futures in outer space. So I'm exploring working across different modes to get at some of that richness and complexity. I started out early in my career training as a social anthropologist and ethnographic filmmaker, but more recently I um, became a fiction writer and an essayist. And in my PhD project, I'm thinking about space across all of these different forms. So I'm writing um, a collection of short stories from the perspectives of real space objects. I'm writing long form narrative nonfiction about space ethics for a general audience. And I'm also making two short experimental films to explore the emotional resonance of space nature and space objects for humans. Moonrise, which is the film that we're about to screen, is the first of those films. It's directed by Rowena Potts, who is a Sydney filmmaker who also trained as a social anthropologist and written and produced by me. What I'm committed to is making art and writing essays about space that are accessible to the general public. I'm not a space expert and I've come in as an outsider. So I'm passionate about taking the often complex scientific discourse that dominates space circles and breaking it down so that non-experts can understand and join in these conversations. And to me, this is also the real power of art and art making, whether that's experimental film or fiction writing. The way that art does not ever offer us a definitive answer to any of our questions, but does ask us to take other perspectives. And that's an approach that I value increasingly. In Moonrise, as you'll see, what Rowena and I and our creative collaborators on the film, including the sound designer and the composer of the original score, have tried to do is play with point of view and look at Earth and humankind from the moon's perspective to see what else might come into view when we include more than human voices. I just wanted to say that we consciously chose for the film a dual gendered voice for the moon. Um, it does take a little while to get used to, especially if you're watching it over a screen like we're all gonna be doing rather than in a cinema. But it was important to us to not have the moon's voice be gendered in a traditional way. The film is about 11 minutes long and I'll now ask Juan to start the screening. Okay, I'm on the top step and I can look down over the RCU and find the gear pad. That's a very simple matter to hop down from one step to the next. You're on, you've got three more steps and then a long one. Okay, I'm going to leave that one. So you've seen that very multi-layered film that speaks directly to artists, anthropologists, sociologists, historians and archaeologists, among many others. So, Dr. Alice Gorman, uh, you've been working on this topic for a long time. How does the film resonate with some of the big debates that you are working with in your area of expertise? Firstly, I'm talking to you today from the land of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains. And while the film definitely speaks to some of those big issues, some of the most compelling parts of it for me are actually on a smaller scale and more intimate. And it's startling to hear the moon have a voice. Hearing the moon speak, however constructed that is by our own culture for me, is, is like a radically different view. And hearing the emotions of the moon that include something we maybe don't associate with it, anger, particularly in those lines, uh, which I just find so 
startling, um, but I am made of much more disturbing stuff, seas of death, bays of lunacy, craters of indifference to humankind. So these, these huge emotions combined with the intimacy with the landscape that the film gives us, I, I think, are really important. And as well as that, the, at the end of the film, the opening out to the broader cosmos, we're so focused on the moon as part of the Earth system that we don't necessarily think of it as facing outwards as well and communicating with the rest of the cosmos. So I think there are some really interesting changes of perspective of the moon that come out of this film. One of the things I'm working on that it very much intersects with is the project of the Declaration of the Rights of the Moon, which one you mentioned earlier and which Keridwen is a, a co-writer on. And this was something that came out of thinking about how we respond to the current push to extract lunar resources and effectively mine the moon. And when I talk about this to just, you know, regular people about the place, there's almost universally an astonishment and horror that this is even being contemplated. People are shocked to learn that we're planning to mine the moon. And what is important, I think, about that shock is that it speaks to the fact that, that everyday people are not connected into the space world. They, they might hear about the fancy missions and the wonderful telescopes, but they're not aware that these things are being planned and, in fact, imminent. So when the small group of us started thinking about this, um, we were working in the context of the rights of nature movement and, and the historic facts of places like the Wanganui River in New Zealand getting legal personhood. And it seemed to us that the moon did not have that perspective and it could be really useful to write such a declaration. So people can read it online. If you go, if you just Google Declaration of the Rights of the Moon, you should get straight to the website. And it's quite short. And in its short life, I guess it has been slightly controversial. We don't expect, I guess, that the whole space world is going to say, um, oh, you know, we didn't think of that. Let's adopt this declaration as a basis for how we work. Part of its point of existence, I guess, is to provide another end to a spectrum which is currently quite restricted. And one of the things that I guess you know you're doing something right if you make people angry. And one of the principal things that makes people angry about the Declaration of the Rights of the Moon is that it forces them to confront their belief that the moon is a dead world. And I get this a lot in sort of discussions in social spaces. People say the moon can have no rights. The moon is not worthy of ethical or moral consideration because it is dead. I think Keridwen's Kerrigan, film shows, if nothing else, that the moon is, is not dead in its own being and in the way we conceptualise it. But the other strand to this commitment to a dead moon, in fact, it's broader than that, it's a commitment to a dead solar system and a dead universe because the conquest and exploitation of space resources is premised on this death. And I will also have to add in here that the pushback I get on this is, is most often from men. And there's a lot of research which shows that taking an interest in the environment in issues of sustainability is considered to be effeminate, not manly enough. So we have a big issue right there. And the Declaration of the Rights of the Moon drops itself into the middle of a whole lot of these debates. So while we don't expect that it's going to be widely acclaimed or adopted. And I'll also add it's a work in progress. We expect it will change. We feel it's a very valuable contribution 
to providing a, a greater breadth of perspectives and ways of engaging with the moon than we currently have. And I think that's also what Keridwen and Rowena's film Moonrise does so brilliantly. Thank that's you, Alice. Thing. Thank you, Alice. We'll, we might come back to you. Um, I would like to also invite um, the listeners if they want to start posting some of their questions or comments in the chat box that we can take them um, after everyone has had a, a turn. I'll turn to Rami Mando now, uh, who uh, leads uh, uh, spaceaustralia.com. And you've been a leader in the space community in Australia, Rami, opening up access to the space community and the voice of minorities transitioning into accessing space. So what are your comments on this film and how does it relate to your work, your platform, and maybe the need uh, of the social sciences to reach out to platforms and space communities like yours? Yeah, look, so first of all, um, I love the movie. Um, it really got me thinking in many different perspectives. Um, a lot of the stuff I uh, thought about, it kind of made me a little bit sad towards the end as well, because, you know, human presence, I felt from after watching that film, was um, never going to leave the moon alone. We were always going to try to conquer and try to be there. And just I think that's just part of human nature. Um, I 100% agree with everything that Alex, Alex just said, sorry. Um, and I absolutely support um, all the uh, information that Alex, Alex just gave. And uh, from my thoughts, I guess, um, you know, I, I really thought about the moon in three sort of different perspectives whilst I was watching it. I was, I was thinking about the timeline of the moon, you know, before humans, during humans, maybe after humans as well. Um, and also about some of the actual uh, 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 independence the moon needs and some of the thinking we need to now start um, in installing amongst uh, our, our communities uh, to consider the moon as an independent body, even if humans are there. Um, you know, a couple of things came to mind, and I'm happy to go into a bit more detail um, during the discussion, but, you know, the moon has its own time, for example, and it's got, a, it's, got its, own, uh, its own resource, which I think is going to be a really powerful uh, thing for the moon uh, in that has a far side of the moon that we don't have here on Earth. And that brings a whole uh, range of, you know, radio astronomy heritage, for example, with it. Um, and lastly, I thought about how the moon uh, and how humans, if they go to the moon, how we, we have to sort of address our problems here on Earth before we go. And I, know, I know that's a very generic statement, but, uh, you know, in context of, you know, my LGBTIQA plus community, uh, how are we, we going to treat that community on the moon? So that gave me a bit of perspective around um what the moon will be like in the future when humans are there um i absolutely love hearing about the moon being its own its own body its own entity its own thinking um and i think that's really an encouraging uh message to send out there as well um but yeah i, I actually really enjoyed the film and how do you see rami um the social sciences and the humanities you know researchers working closer with the space community and platforms like the ones that you're leading. I think we are all in this together to, you know, excuse the pun, um, but we cannot work in silos anymore. In fact, the experiment we're doing today is sparking a debate through a film, not through an article published in a journal that only a few academics can read. So uh, I think, what are your thoughts about that, you know, working together uh, with the social sciences from your point of view? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the key things that I try to get the message out there a lot about is that um, I, 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 I don't like the word space industries um, because I think industry sort of limits it down to a close circle of people who are involved in uh, in the space industry itself. So you either work for a space agency or a space company or a supply chain. Um, I like talking about space in the terms of community, which is a broader context. So you've got um, not just the, the core industry or the government players or the, you know, the, the, the businesses of commercialization, but also the wider community. So the artists, the amateur astronomers, uh, you know, the, the, the young kids who actually stare up at the moon um, on a nightly basis and ask why. Like there's a whole range of, of uh, people who is a larger sort of audience, which I call the space community. And I think everyone has a right to that community and everyone should participate in that community. And, and they are kind of involved in it because we all look up and, and question what are the stars, what are the moons, um, you know, our calendars based on the moon cycle, you know, that was invented a couple of thousand years ago. Uh, so whether we like it or not, we are part of this space community. We're actually on a spaceship. It's called Earth. It's orbiting the sun. Um, so we're all part of this, you know, this bigger, broader space community. And I think that we need to incorporate those views um, and those learnings um, and those understandings, especially from, you know, for example, the Indigenous uh, 
nations all around the world about how they treat space and um, factor that into our, our thinking and our understanding and our pr- pr- proposals before we extend ourselves out into the universe. Thank you, Rami. I'll turn to Jeremy now, Dr. Jeremy Walker. And you um, have been working on you know, climate justice and environmentalism and the economics of environmentalism for a while. So I want to, you know, bring you to that link between, you know, you know, around a discussion about space environmentalism and the links of climate justice movements on Earth and this new appreciation of apprehension of space as an environment. What are your thoughts there? Uh, thank you, Juan. I just want to begin by also uh, acknowledging that I'm uh, calling in from Bidjigal country. And I guess uh, these acknowledgements are often something of a formality that we, um, as far as I understand it, what we mean when we say we acknowledge the traditional custodians of law for country is that that we respect the the obligation to maintain um, the the abundance of the biological community and it's you know the laws which maintain that indefinitely into the future so i guess that's my um take on you know what i'm trying to do here so i just want to say thanks for the film for inviting me um i i think what really comes to the fore for me is that um in the film is the, the on the one hand there's this kind of uh, the to me it's really a question we're looking at here is it, of the difference between life and death in the largest scale that we can imagine it which is the scale of the earth um and there's the the way in which our imaginaries um of of, the, of space and the future uh, can, uh are linked very much to how we imagine the future of life on earth itself um so one's asked me to talk about the climate emergency and how i could see how how the question of space is related to that um, I think the way, so I have done some work on uh, two aspects of this problem. And the thing that I'm particularly interested in is, um, I guess, the new space race, which is being, being driven by, um, unlike the kind of uh, rhetoric of the you know, classical uh, 20th century space race, which was about coming in peace for all mankind, mankind and uh, with the sort of uh, stories around scientific exploration and so on. The current um, story is around commercialization of space resources and space mining in particular. Um, and I guess this is really, I found this in a really compressed form in a slogan of a, one of these sort of startup companies which wants to expand um, onto the moon uh, to generate, you know, mining of uh, resources on the moon. Um, it's called iSpace. And their, their slogan is expand our planet and expand our future. And for me, um, this really just captures in a nutshell what's, um, I guess, uh, um, on you know, this sort of utopian and impossible imaginary of, of the current uh, move into space, right? On the one hand, it's quite impossible to expand our planet. Um, this, but the idea that there's this sort of imperative to expand uh, other biological life into beyond the Earth, that, that somehow we're going to increase the biosphere and, and get gravit purchase beyond the Earth. Or on the other hand, that we need to go into space to, you know, um, expand our mineral resource base and, you know, into space that we can't, we won't run out of mineral resources either. Um, and the idea of ex- the link of that to the idea of expanding the future, I think, is, I guess, part of the bad conscience of this this movement in the sense that um, certainly, you know, for those of us who have children are very much aware of, um, as Juan mentioned in his introduction, that um, that the Earth, set, the biosphere is not expanding, it's shrinking very quickly in terms of biodiversity, but also in terms of biomass as, you know, uh, coral reefs, um, uh, you know, die and um, as forests you know, burn, in, burn off into, in huge cataclysms, they're becoming, uh, being converted back into carbon dioxide and things which further accelerate the climate emergency. So this kind of... Um, yeah, so there's there's two ways in which I, I'm interested in this question. I'll try to be very quick about it because we're very short on time. Firstly, that if there's ever to be human presence beyond um, beyond the Earth, and and so far the the you know, the most we've managed to do is to keep a, a very small number of people alive for a short period of time in um, in low Earth orbit by supplying it constantly with you know uh, with material from the Earth through you know um, 
uh, rocket deliveries. If, if, if we're actually able to go beyond that, then we need to be able to construct uh, autonomous self-regenerating life support systems. Um, in other words, minimal biospheres. So, um, you know, but we have to bring the bring some part of the biological community with us that's capable of completely recycling all of our um, bodily waste and turning it back into air and fuel and water, um, air and food and water. And I guess to, to cut a long story short, I, I really don't think that this is going to be viable um, um, for a very long time, if, if ever. Um, so, and, and the other side of my interest, um, so, so that's, that's coming from work I did with Céline Grandjou, on the European Space Agency's um, microbial ecological life support system alternative. Um, and that's a, a very long way from being um, remotely viable. Secondly, the other aspect of my interest in this, so if it's impossible to, you know, even support human life um, indefinitely um, without complete dependence on um, extracting and, and resources from the earth, this means that it's impossible I guess, to realise the vision of, um, of mining space um, in any meaningful sense, uh, mining space resources. So what is the function of this sort of dream? Um, I guess part of it is the dream of commercialising and industrialising the solar system is about, um, I guess, uh, creating it is part of it as a sort of, it's part of this um, refusal of this dream of infinite growth to die. Um, and it's a dangerous dream for us because it's um, uh, because um, you know for, for for the way that it permanently defers um, the realization that we live on a finite planet. The other aspect, of which I'll try to be very brief on this, but uh, is looking at the way in which the legal order um, of the the um, outer space treaty, which this sort of common heritage of, of mankind, this. Um, it's a UN-based international law based on uh, commons management and um, uh, common interests. Um, um, how this this kind of uh, has been arguably overturned by the unilateral um, attribution of property rights to corporations. So very briefly, the um, um, we were, I guess we're all aware of the Outer Space Treaty, which prohibited sovereign um, claims in space. Um, in 2015, Barack Obama signed into the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act, which um, gave US um, citizens and businesses um, commercial rights to own, transport, use and sell asteroid resources and space resources. Um, and so this kind of privatisation, uh, unilateral privatisation of space resources um, through the United States really I see this as of a piece with the undermining of international law, um, which has been accomplished by uh, the neoliberal movement, um, particularly through um, think tanks um, associated with the New Space Lobbying Network, which are also associated with the undermining of um, the UN law of the sea. Um, and as we approach you know, other commons, interest um, attempts to regulate uh, resource appropriation, like the new international economic order of the 1970s, and as we approach the present, um, the, the organised obstruction and undermining of, the, of uh, climate, um, of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the various attempts to give that effect. So I guess I'll just leave that there because there's a lot in that. Thank you very much. I'll turn back to Alice and uh, a question by Kerit when uh, you were one of the first people to write or think about the need for an environmental ethics of outer space. So... What is the story of how you came to think about space in, in that way? Unmute, please. Um, the, the background to this, I guess, is because before I started working on space, I was um, uh, working as a cultural heritage consultant, pr primarily around Indigenous and Australian historic heritage. Um, in and working on environmental impact studies, uh, particularly for mines. So I did a lot of work on coal mining in the Hunter Valley, uranium, copper, a whole range of other uh, mines in South Australia. And, and, and that was effectively my professional work. I was often part of large multidisciplinary teams who were doing these environmental impact studies. So when I started working on space, 
that was simply the most logical way to start thinking about it. And it became very evident to me quickly on that although occasionally people did talk about space as an environment, they didn't talk about Earth orbit as an environment. And the definition of environment uh, incorporated living ecologies. So it was, as I used to describe it, a very thin definition that wasn't sufficient for encompassing the whole range of engagements that we would have with space. So um, I, I think we're past that now, but for me, it was simply a logical progression. It, it in order to, to have the right kinds of actions, I think, that enable us to be better custodians of space, we have to start with different definitions and environment is definitely at the core of that. I think that's so interesting, Alice. Sorry to jump in, but, um, you know, sometimes when I think about the idea of mining the moon, uh, the technologies will obviously exist at some point in the future, but I think the work that, you know, we can do now is to kind of chip away at some of the social license to operate yeah. um, as has had to happen on earth, but we have a bit of lead time, you know, because that's still a, a, a sort of speculative technology. We have time, you know, for once to try and get the ethical and environmental thinking to keep pace with the technology and then through um, community engagement um, and getting other people involved in the conversation to kind of undermine even that idea of the, you know, social license to be doing any kind of mining on the moon. It's If I can just say one more thing, it's really interesting in the space community because they still hold to this idea that any kind of uh, environmental stuff is in opposition to carrying out these activities. That is not how things, well, it is sometimes, but in terrestrial mining, that's not how it works anymore. That's People had to get over that stuff a long time ago. In the space community, they're only just starting to understand this, and I'm starting to have to have, uh, well, you know, not quite battles with people, but say to people, you're talking about sustainability. This is at the core of, of it. So you can't use the words and not mean to take the actions and, and you have to let go of the idea that these are oppositional. They are not oppositional. They are part of the same process. So I think that we do have time to get it right now, but we've got a lot of people to persuade that this is actually a necessary thing to do. We have just 10 minutes left, which is great. Uh, we have a first question from the audience by Matilda Vaughan. And she says, it was a very thought provoking film. Thank you speakers and panelists for all your insightful reflections. How should we preference and communicate our space endeavors for the seeking of knowledge for care of our own planet and environment instead of becoming a playground for the rich and famous or another place for exploitation for profit. Anyone would like to take that one? This is the million dollar question. <laughs> Jeremy, you have your your. Can I have a go? Thank you. Uh, look, I don't. I, if uh, the question of how, I guess what I'm trying to, what I'm interested in, is the extent to which the. Um, the I get what we could arguably see is the abrogation of the um, international UN based law around uh, common, um, you know, non appropriation of space. Because what happens when you know the US or you know uh, uh, Luxembourg or some other kind of um, you know tax haven or corporate registry for jurisdiction shopping, um, you know attributes private property rights and they're actually dragging state power back into you know, and that's that's one of the things that, that came to me through the, um working with my phd student matt johnson who did a great study on this is that the history in a way of the international law of um of nations is really very and, and of the sovereignty of states but the power of private corporations is very closely linked to um to the appropriate to appropriation of mineral resources historically and, and as we move into into space i guess um what i'd like people to, to pay attention to is um the extent to which this legal order that, that's now emerging around space that i guess you know is is being driven um 
is part of what we might, what I might call a neoliberal constitutionalism that's emerged um, to govern common to govern the earth. Um, you know, since the nineteen seventies, and it's that same kind of legal order which makes it very difficult to do climate action. So I guess if it's not really a um, there's not obviously not a quick answer to your question, but I think that. You know the same the same um, political organisation and forces which have made it possible for you know uh, people like Bezos to exist, people who you know not only pay next to no tax but also uh, benefit from vast public subsidies. Um, it's the same for the political organisation which is also obstructing climate action. Um, and I guess the, the, so. I would ask people to really pay attention to that. It's very similar. Uh, network of think tanks that have here in Australia, you know, um, converted Australia into something appropriate, uh, approaching a petro state. And we need to pay attention to that and try and imagine other forms of um, constitutional order on earth, which would then be extended to space. The question by Matilda was also about how we communicate our space endeavors for the seeking of knowledge for care. So Rami, in, in, in your perspective, as a you know, working with citizen science and communication, how do you address this question? Yeah, look, it's a it's a good question and there's no silver bullet, um, but effectively, um, you know, I've got a couple of thoughts about this. Um, one of the things I, I, I try to tell people about um, is to uh, stop idolising uh, big players and big figures um, who are actually in, in the headlines all the time. So, for example, the last few months, uh, we've had three names, you know, Branson, Musk and uh, Bezos, who have been in the headlines the whole time. And it's kind of dominating the space conversation, just these three people. So we've got to stop idolising these people as, as, you know, demigods and making them, you know, these wonderful characters who are taking humanity up to the next level of uh, part of our evolution. Um, and we need to scale that back and, and talk about how um, the greater community is adding value to the whole space conversation. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a really wonderful story that's come from Sydney um, about three uh, refugee uh, students who are, I think, Western Sydney University, I believe, or somewhere out there. Um, and they're effectively, um, they you know, built a prototype computer that's been sent up on a SpaceX rocket on, on a Polish satellite. It's going to revolutionise the way that, um, you know, satellites look back at Earth. And why aren't we talking about them? Why aren't we talking about their stories? Um, and so effectively, um, I think we need to sort of take away the power that the, the, the big players have um, and, and, and give it back to the people when it comes to communications about what's happening in the space community as well. I would absolutely second that. Go Western Sydney University. <laughs> we need more stories. Um, one final question uh, to wrap up and, and pass back to Roy. Um, thank you, Matilda, for, for your question is um, as the social sciences and the humanities are being called to work closer with scientists, work closely with activists, work closely with communities, with artists, and not just work in their own silos, what is the role you think or the big questions that you are uh, think that the social sciences and the humanities will be needing to address in the next few years around space? We have a long you know, track record or trajectory of being critical and providing critique. I don't think being critical uh, is the only thing that we can do. You know, We don't provide solutions, but we provide responses uh, to this big predicament. So I'll just quickly go through you all and what are the key questions or debates that you're looking forward to address in now or in the near future in your work? Alice. You work closely with industry, for instance. Ah, uh, this is too. So, so I'm a member of the Council of the Space Industry Association of Australia. If I and and have been for a long time, and I I, I think it's very important to be supporting Australian space industry. And well, is this a big question? I don't know, but I think. From this perspective, I don't want Australia to simply be replicating at a lower more um, uh, less exciting scale what other people are doing. I want to see Australia taking some, some leadership in its role in space. And I think that's not necessarily going to be technology. It's going to be about ideas. I think one of the key questions here 
is incorporating Indigenous perspectives into not just the sky knowledge and astronomy, but into technology, to designing this stuff from the ground up rather than adding people in at the last minute. In fact, we've got some people who are doing some good stuff on this. And, and I suppose I don't want to overuse decolonizing, which has been now starting to become almost slightly meaningless, I'm sad to say, but by starting from that position, which is not a, a comfortable place for Australia, by starting from that position, we can make some new dialogues around space that could have an impact on how people in the rest of the world are looking at them. So maybe that's enough for it for me at the moment. I think we do have an opportunity in Australia to rewrite some of the scripts, to reimagine some of the imaginaries, and it's going to take work from the social science perspectives to make that come about. Thank you. Um, Kerit, when you started as a social anthropologist and then moved into more, more exciting uh, things, becoming a world-renowned author, so how do you see the social sciences looking from the outside in and the role or, you know, working together with artists or authors? What are the key questions you're working with? We just collaborated with an anthropologist on an outstanding film. Um, I mean, everything I do in my artistic practice is informed by my um, original love of social anthropology um, and what ethnographic fieldwork can do, which is bring that thick description uh, to the world and also understand meaning making um, among humans. Um, and that's something that, you know, I keep coming back to in um, the other forms that I work in. But I, as you were asking that question, I was sort of thinking, what is the thing that I'm trying to do in working across these different forms? And um, I thought back to a few years ago, I interviewed Bill McKibben, the original climate change activist when he was in Sydney. And I remember asking him, you know, a lot of um, parents have been asking you to write a book about climate change for young children so that we have a way to explain what's going on to them. Um, and are you thinking of doing that? And he said, absolutely not. I think that is a terrible idea. I think what children need um, right now is to fall in love with the planet because you cannot um, defend something that you don't first love. And I think maybe in, you know, the work that I'm doing in outer space and trying to kind of work in the shadows of, of meaning and emotion and connection is to um, help people fall in love with space and not just the space geeks, um, you know, not just the people who, who are really into, you know, sci-fi and all of that, but people outside of those communities who, um, you know, perhaps have not looked at the moon as an analogue to Antarctica, even though, you know, the legal treaties are very similar. Um, and what changes when they fall in love with space as nature? Um, you know, what will then be allowed to happen in these places instead of seeing the moon as a ball of rare earth minerals, but as a place that you love deeply and a landscape that you value for all these other reasons. Um, and perhaps at that point, um, you know, there'll be other ideas of what we might do out there or that we do nothing at all. And that's something that I think, you know, we assume that everybody, that every human on earth thinks that it's in the human uh, destiny to go to space. And I, I disagree. I think the fundamental question that the social sciences can ask, as Roy said right at the beginning, it's not just about the how and the why, but the whether, you know, if this is even a good idea at all. And I'm actually more and more in the camp of perhaps the best way to express this love and care for nature in space is to leave it alone. Uh, that's the best way we could possibly ask for to wrap up our panel. Thank you, Keridwen. Thank you, Rami. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Alice. It's time to go back to Roy. I'll just uh, like to say that um, hopefully the experiment with the format has worked for the audience. We tried to move away from having short, you know, academic presentations and try to engage you all through a more conversation. I think conversation is, and dialogue is something that we're lacking more and more, and people just presenting um, uh, is, you know, lacking on, on emotion. So hopefully watching the film and having a conversation has worked 
for you all to introduce this webinar series. Thank you all and back to you, Roy. I don't often unmute myself, but there we are. Um, thank you, uh, Juan, so much uh, for setting the scene and to all our speakers and, and for Cardin's inspiring and challenging film and for giving such a, a, a good uh, start to our series, uh, to break, which sets out to break down the silos to which many of you have referred. Uh, and of course, points to, in many ways, as Alice has nicely uh, stated, the importance of Australia and Australians in, in leading the conversation, in capturing something of the the spirit and the emotion that's involved. And certainly it's been part of my life since I was at the Air and Space Museum as the chair of aerospace history back <laughs> a decade ago. Uh, and it's, it's certainly also, I think, speaks to the importance of the next session in our series, which touches as deeply as we can of the circumstances into the history of um, uh, Aboriginal astronomy and the contribution of First Nations to our uh, discourse. Uh, that will be, in fact, the, uh, the domain which will be led, excuse me, by um, uh, Professor Rosalind Haynes of the University of New South Wales, starting at 11 o'clock, if we're lucky. And I thank you for um, uh, your contributions, those of you who have been able to attend. Uh, I remind you that the series has been or is being um, conserved and will be available thereafter. I see Chris uh, appearing. <laughs> Hello again, Chris. And I'm sure he will ensure that that will happen. Uh, if anyone, uh, if any one of you can contribute to any of the later sessions or watch them, observe them or retrieve them afterwards, I'd be very grateful for your comments too, because I think that a number of the points that you uh, outlined will be drilled down, so to speak, in what others will say. Uh, thank you again. And uh, I wanted to uh, pass, the, pass the, the baton back to Chris, I think, who will then conclude. Is that right? <laughs> thank you, Roy. Uh, I won't uh, say much more. I've, I'll just pop the link to the registration for all of the rest of the seminars, uh, the webinars in the chat. Um, if any of the participants here would like to join or a message on to others, we'd love to see you. And uh, on behalf of the Academy and all of our panellists, thanks once again. Thanks to our panellists as well. See you later. Bye-bye. Okay.